Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about Bob Dylan. For today's episode, we have a really fascinating interview with an academic who has found a way to connect his knowledge of classics with his love of classic folk rock. Richard Thomas is the George Martin Lane Professor of the Classics at Harvard University, where he studies and teaches Latin poetry and classical reception. For a while now, he's been teaching a freshman seminar on Bob Dylan, and after Dylan was awarded the 2016 Nobel Prize for Literature, he set about writing a book to demonstrate some of the reasons that honour was deserved. Why Bob Dylan Matters is the result, and it explores the classical allusions in some of Dylan's more recent albums and draws out the similarities between his approach to poetry and the work of Catullus, Virgil, and Ovid. This book is a fascinating read for a Dylan fan, but it's also an engaging introduction to his work for people who may be more familiar with ancient literature than modern folk rock, with careful readings of Dylan's lyrics, explorations of his writing process, and a passionate defense of the relevance, subtlety, emotional power, and lasting significance of the songwriter's work. The book, published by Harper Collins, has just gone on sale on November 21st and is available everywhere. Professor Thomas will be doing some readings in early December. December 4th, he will be in Boston at Newtonville Books at 7 p.m. On December 6th, he'll be in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities, also at 7 p.m. Details about these events are in the show notes if you'd like to hear more. Now, we were so excited to talk to Richard Thomas that we kind of forgot about introductions and just plunged right into our discussion. So please forgive the abrupt opening, and we hope you enjoy our discussion as much as we did. One of the things that, that really interests me about this book is it, it really hits on one of my interests, which is sort of bridging the ancient and the modern, both through influence and through parallels. Is this something that you've always been interested in, or is Dylan a special case for you? you know, I've, the last 20 years or so, I've been interested in what, what we call the reception of, of the classical world, and in other words, the, the stream, as I as I call it, that goes from Homer on down to Seamus Heaney and Dylan and beyond. So um, classicists used to just sort of stick to their stick to the ancient world and see going outside of that as something that was um, transgressive of the discipline and so on. But that's all all changed, and I've sort of changed with it. I always uh, in school uh, loved um, English literature and poetry in particular, and so um, so always had that sort of in my in my mind and Dylan sort of became a part of that many many years ago yeah so it's um it's you know he's not and I think what I I think what the book does and what I hope it does is show that Dylan is part of a a a long um process that that you know mm-hmm. that, that the human mind has produced in in literature I mean he's, he's simply part of it and uh, his genius is um is is not unlike the genius of the poets that he's been going back to in in my area in the last twenty years, Homer, mm-hmm. Bert, Harvard, and so on. Yeah, that it's not disconnected; um, it's part of a similar process. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, the move towards um, reception studies, both as a separate study, but also, and, and I think I'm more pleased with this, the the integration of it into not so, just simply that there's classical reception, which is a type of scholarship that's separate, but that classicists who do both classical material and more generally reception studies, that those can be integrated within one body of work is something that I think is a really positive move um, that the field has slowly gone towards, not seeing one as, as more important than the other. Right. And it was, you know, if you look at the 19th century, poets like Coleridge and Wordsworth and Mm -hmm. Tennyson, maybe particularly Tennyson, and his relationship to poets like Virgil. I mean, they were they were part of that part of that process, and it's it's really only in in some ways in the 20th century that that got disrupted, and that Mm -hmm. that um, you know that there wasn't a continuity. So I think that's partly also why Dylan is going back to the 19th century and going back through the folk traditions of which he's a, a master to people like, uh, you know, Robert Burns and, and others. Mm-hmm. So it's, this is something that he's known about for a long time. He's been in a tradition. I think the more so-called high register 
poets, um, i.e. the ones who survive because they get written down. Um, that's that's really only since 1997 or 2001, but it's um, it's not it's not any um, different from the process that he's always been part of. Mm-hmm. It's not a break with previous practice. It's an extension of it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're right. There's that that interesting break uh, with in in particularly the the first half of the 20th century, where the modern modernist poets kind of turned their backs on the the long literary tradition that uh, that went before them, um, with a few exceptions, of course, like T. S. Eliot. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. And and. And Pound to some extent, but Pound, of course, you know, despised some of the classics or, or claimed to, and was was mm-hmm. into other corners for his influences. And um, but yeah, no, exactly. I think it is the, the moderns, and I think it's things like the First World War. And I mean, if mm-hmm. look at Wilfred Owen, you know, who is a classicist, Arms and the Boy is is a is a version of Arms and the Man, the mm-hmm. Aeneid, but exposing what you know, what epic poetry is about. It's about the glorification of the killing of young men like himself who died in the trenches. And I mean, had 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 he survived, he, I think we would have seen him as a as a modern who would have been doing interesting things with his tradition in the same way that, that uh, Eliot did. Yeah, to a, some extent that break was caused by the literal killing off of a generation, of, a generation of, yeah. of poets who were steeped in that tradition, but would have had a different take on it after the war. And yeah. We have a few examples of that, but too many of them were lost. Elliot didn't, notoriously didn't sort of fight, but um, as... Mm-hmm. The, one of the things that really struck me about, um, as you'd sort of talked about the, the history in the last 10, 15 years of what you call Dylanology, I know you're not the only one who calls it that, um, is that many of the insights into sort of Dylan's use of... of written texts of more modern and classical texts that you describe come about pretty serendipitously, um, moments of really unexpected connections between a text that somebody happens to be reading and, and the po- the I'm going to call them poems over and over again, the songs that they're listening to. Um, one of the things that struck me about that is that I think it demonstrates the value of not being too specialized in one's own interests scholarship but also just interests not restricting yourself too much to oh i read latin poetry or oh i like folk music or rock or whatever um that it that these insights have come through people who have wide and maybe seemingly disparate interests yeah no i think that's i think that's true and the the, the very conscious engagement with the classical text there is this uh, curious instance uh, back in uh, in the song "Changing of the Guards" in the late seventies, but um, mm-hmm. where he seems to, in a draft, to have been reading Virgil's mm-hmm. fourth eclogue, the so-called messianic mm-hmm. eclogue. But mm-hmm. it really starts in two thousand and one, and when, as I as I write about in the book, when I when I heard the verses from "Lonesome Day Blues," that that take one right back to the sixth book of the Aeneid. It was because mm-hmm. I had the Aeneid hardwired that that I, I heard that. And then a notorious example of the New Zealand um, uh, teacher, actually, I think he's British, but Cliff Fell, who was um, who was preparing for a class and was reading Ovid having, in 2006, having hardwired modern times. And as he put it, suddenly the, the page started singing to him. So, <laughs> and then the process since that, I mean, um, has been, there's been sort of more, Googling than than having the songs activate the memory of of texts right. that one had um, you know gotten control of in in other ways through writing about them or teaching. So now I think a more intentional process now. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and but useful, you know, useful to have these work, particularly um, Scott Warmuth is the one who's sort of recovered the all of these fragments or many of them um also robert polito who is a who's a humanist himself mm-hmm. but uh, what my book i think does is is show or suggest what dylan is is actually doing by taking on these texts so mm-hmm. uh, trying to interpret their presence in the songs yeah to some extent it parallels the process of uh, sort of source 
scholarship in the 19th and 20th centuries where first people find the connections and before the 19th century, but uh, in the classical poetry, I'm thinking of, you know, making the lists, the lists and lists and lists of illusions. And then the later 20, the second half of the 20th century, you know, developing a theory of intertextuality and developing uh, work on what's going on, on yeah, understanding no, them and explaining them rather than just finding them. Right. That's a terrific Terrific uh, observation, and and yeah, I mean, my early work on intertextuality was sort of dubbed source criticism because that's what people, people were used familiar. To call it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and so you had commentaries that said CF Homer Odyssey yeah. book ten line whatever, but didn't say why you should CF it, and so um, that yeah, what ele- what at all that added to one's understanding of the text to know that it came from Homer, right? There was a reference to Homer. Yeah, and and I was thinking about that process. Yeah, the I mean, how one goes about, you know, doing this kind of work with specifically with a modern writer like Dylan, where there isn't that whole body of scholarship to already existing to su- sort of support that those that sort of work. Um, and someone you, with such a large text, large it's not text, like Dylan yeah. is a small amount of uh, a small work, body of work to. Get handle on, and you mention in the, in the book that the importance of serendipity, just you know, finding these things by accident, now intentionally looking for them, uh, is uh, a, it seems to me a daunting uh, process. Yeah, it is. I mean, but of course, with search engines now, you can you can sort of find stuff out there, and that's mm-hmm. and that's what's been happening. And I'm not sure. I think Dylan. I think he wasn't. The Dil- Dylan wasn't particularly pleased that all of this sort of googling happened, particularly when it was then contextualized with with a sort of um, wrong theories about plagiarism and so on. You know, right. the, all poetry is is plagiarism. Nothing is really original. It's how you reshape through your mind and your technical skill um, what's part of your tradition. And and Dylan is is like no, you know, just like any other poet mm-hmm. in that. Sense, but you know when the when they wall you know the Wall Street Journal gets hold of a of, of a an observation about plagiarism, that's simply how it will present it. And um, mm-hmm. uh, but I think that's changing. I think there's a sense now, and I mean not just with the Nobel, but I think there's a sense um, out there that it's now you know not not just among um, specialists, but there's a, a general sense that what Dylan has done, you know. In reshaping uh, works in his tradition is is something that is part of his genius, and it's mm-hmm. different from what he did early on, but not radically different. What he was doing with Rambeau in Mr. Tambourine Man or or Chimes of Freedom, I think, is was was similar. But then, you know, his art was also slightly different. He himself has said he didn't know where those songs came from, and and they. Mm-hmm. Sort of came tumbling out in in, in different <laughs> ways, but you know, the fact that it's more cerebral maybe in recent years, but that still, you know, to do what he does with his now visible tradition is something that nobody else could do, other than Bob Dylan. Mm-hmm. I think maybe maybe we can f- we need to find some way. It's in parallel to the notorious Alexandrian footnote, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the way of that that. Um, Classical authors, I know you know this, but the way that classical authors were sometimes said to mark their sources or mark not where their source was, but that it was from a source with the it is said or right. some people say um, before a, a line or a reference to a story or a myth that comes from a particular source. And it's sort of a, hey, I'm I'm about to do some source work, but it's up to you to figure out where it comes from. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that. Virgil at the beginning of Aeneid six, so Daedalus, as the story goes, through, yes, exactly, and, and and the story is in fact in the poet Catullus, mm-hmm. and Virgil wants us to to recognize that because recognizing that and invoking that Catullan context, um, one of loss, um, which is what Virgil's mm-hmm. also talking about, Daedalus's loss of Icarus is something that enriches and. Uh, uh, Dylan's sort of gone beyond this in a way. I mean, a song like Early Roman Kings, um, <laughs> you know, when we all heard the title, thought, oh, great, he's uh, going to talk about Romulus and Remus and, and the Early Roman Kings. But 
it turned out then that they were he was sort of frustrating that expectation and playing with that expectation by the fact that the Roman kings are a Latino gang from the 1960s from New York. But then the second verse um, actually has the early Ro- Roman kings distributing the corn. So those are the Roman kings. And then, mm-hmm. and then later he's got Homer, uh, he's got Odysseus taunting the, the Cyclops. So, you know, he himself has said, you know, there's no meaning in my songs, you know, don't look for meaning. And I think, of course, one never. His Dylan is the ultimate unreliable uh, <laughs> narrator of his own life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that raises the interesting question. Um, and it, of course, it's hard to to you know guess the the intentions of a writer. But uh, to what extent Dylan wants us to to look for those references, even when he says not to. Mm-hmm. When you were saying that about Virgil, I mean, that's the thing that the heavy intertextuality of Roman poets like Catullus or Virgil, I mean, we often say that it's it's a challenge to the reader. It's a way of marking the sort of intellectual lineage of the poet. There's a lot of reasons that they use the not not just that they use the occasional line, but that it's, you know, deeply embeddedly like the opening of Catullus 64 with its 17 layers of allusion to Kalimachian and Hellenistic texts and back to Medea, the Medea of Euripides, things like that, um, that one of the levels of that kind of poetry is a sort of uh, marking of the ideal reader or uh, an engaging in a com- commonality of here's, we have the same source material to draw on, you're going to recognize it. Do you think that's what Dylan is doing at all, or or is there something else? No, I think so. I mean, if you look at a song which doesn't have classical intertext on it, Mm -hmm. uh, a song like Trying to Get to Heaven in from um, Time Out of Mind, 1997, which is when the the comeback really, the comeback and the use of texts and the rewriting of other poets really uh, becomes a fundamental part of his art. Mm -hmm. So that in the book, I have, I have several pages of the, the sort of gospel, folk, and blues, um, lines that are sort of both basically sort of taken taken over the, uh, rewritten and mm-hmm. create the song of somebody who's who's in trouble you know um we don't know what the trouble is and that's part of the mystery of it when i was in missouri they would not let me be who are they and and you know mm-hmm. what did not letting him be the singer be uh consist of but you know you've got house of the rising sun is in there um um John the Revelator, who Dylan talks yeah. about in his Nobel lecture, um, is one of the things that he absorbed. He talks in that lecture about absorbing the vernacular of the folk um, world, and I think in many ways he become all of these characters. Or his his, um, his writing voice and his singing voice has become just a part of this tradition, and I think mm-hmm. that's exactly what Virgil's doing with his tradition mm-hmm. you know, back to Homer. So do you think he, he want well, I mean, you've kind of answered that already, that he was seemed a little annoyed that people were publicizing or talking about the specifics of um, some of those borrowings. Uh, do, you, do you think he wanted them to be f- not the not the folk intertext, which I agree, I, uh, there's a little bit of a different quality to that because that is part of a larger tradition that he expects his audience to have inside them as well, I think. But with the more literary references, do you think he's picking them up because he wants us to recognize their context and make those intertextual connections? Or is it more of a, those are lines that he likes, those resonances, and he, so he's going to write that song, but he doesn't necessarily feel expect everyone to catch them, something in between? Is it is it different for every example? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. I mean, I think early on, say, on Love and Theft with a song like Lonesome Day Blues, which has the Virgil slightly mm-hmm. worked, but also has um, you know, the Japanese uh, confessions of a Yakuza and also has Hakun in the same song. I think I think that that is part of his art, sort of rewriting. And I think he has an ear and an eye in reading for what will what is poetic and mm-hmm. and what he can really work in his art. But um, so I think I don't think he cares on some level what um, mm-hmm. what we think or, or know. He cares only the, about the art and how and how well it works. Um, mm-hmm. Now that I think changed a bit. So after two thousand and 
1906 when the Harvard and Henry Timrod, the Confederate poet, were was spotted. Why did he, six years later in 2012, um, so noticeably, and he knew he knew about the Googlers at that point. <laughs> he knew you were looking for it, yeah. yeah he knew, knew people were looking for it. And, um, um, and is that then, is it becoming a game, a sort of a... a um, a, a nodding and winking to the mm-hmm. to the audience I and mean, to the reader, to the listener, um, maybe partly. But the songs, you know, Tempest, the songs of Tempest are, in my view, the among the very greatest songs that he's ever written. I mean, I just um, mm-hmm. so there may be some playfulness, but that playfulness is also part of um, the classical tradition. Virgil has acrostics, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. he has yeah. about the gates of war, and he has the uh, word M-A-R-S starting four consecutive lines for Mars. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so that, you know, at one of the most serious moments of his epic, he's he's also being playful, and that's that's what poets do, right? Mm-hmm. And he doesn't sacrifice those, those four lines are not the worst because he had to move, or move them around in order to create the acrostic. He's not right, creating right. A, a lesser piece of work because he wanted to throw in a joke. Yeah. He and can they do both because he's Virgil. <laughs> right. If you or I did it, they would be worse. But yeah. <laughs> if Virgil and Dylan do it, it's um you know, that that's what art and, and poetry and songwriting at that level are all about. Yeah, in some ways you could see it not so much as oh, I, I don't know, but one could imagine it being not so much a playful now it's a game, but that knowing that people are looking for it frees him up in a way to use a little bit more with the expectation that as well as being good songs for those who know nothing about the intertexts that he can now expect his audience to be able to find some of them. He's able to have now sort of a constructed ideal audience who is going to be on the lookout for odd things. So not a game necessarily, but another layer he can add to his work now. Now he can have that layer too and know that some people will be able to pull those intertextual resonances in and that for others who don't, it doesn't matter because the poems are still masterpieces. Uh, songs, <laughs> songs are still masterpieces on their own. Right, absolutely, and that that's the same. You can read Homer or Virgil just mm-hmm. uh, without any any knowledge um, mm-hmm. of the traditions, um, because they're just such great expressions of of what it means to be human and to die. What empire is about in all of its problematic nature, what war is about, what homecoming is about, or the mm-hmm. ability for home to achieve homecoming. Mm-hmm. The intertexts add, but they do, are not required for the work right. to be good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if they, if you need them, then it becomes sort of frigid and, and mm-hmm. um, sort of art purely for art's sake and, and artificial, essentially. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what you know, we, we know about those traditions, right? The worst, the least accessible um, poetry of Hellenistic poetry. I won't name the names because I have friends <laughs> who work on some of them, but the, the ones that are impenetrable without having a, a lexicon. Right. Like uh, the now uh, lost, uh, we can we can say this because it's lost, so it's not a, a problem, but the, was it Nipos or I, I can't remember who it is who did the, the work that needed a commentary within its own generation. Oh, right. Um, yeah. In the, yeah. among the Neoterics that imme- yeah. as soon as it was published, it needed a commentary because nobody could understand it. Exactly. And, that, and we don't have it anymore. And there's right. probably a reason for that. <laughs> right. And euphoria and, you know, yeah. it starts in the Hellenistic period, but yeah, that, yeah. that absolutely. And it's, and it's Virgil who, who, you know, there are parts of Catullus is a great poet, so even mm-hmm. when he's being allusive um, and, you know, has these, these references that are not easily catchable, he's still writing poetry, but things could have developed in, a, in an interior way. Um, mm-hmm. Virgil came along and, and you know, rested this- the tradition around again, yeah, yeah. Partly, I mean, Eliot's essay, What is a Classic, is a problematic essay, but I think it's right that, that Virgil. You can't define a classic without going through Virgil because, and at the maturity of language, the, the sort of moment in history and the genius of a particular particular poet. Um, and if you think about Dylan, you know, we're dealing with pretty much uh, pretty much the same confluence of, mm-hmm. um, of circumstances. Historical moment and maturity of tradition and individual talent. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So although they might not have the same cultural impact as Dylan, are there other songwriters who would whose work would repay such an intertextual reading, uh, especially with respect to the classical material? And uh, you mentioned in, in the in the book, you know, the two albums that you brought with you uh, to the U.S. Um, the other one was Leonard Cohen. That might be an example. Yeah, he's your guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> There's no uh, hometown bias here at all. <laughs> right. Well, I um, I first heard Leonard Cohen when I was um, when I was 16 years old, um, or was it 17? Uh, a, a friend of my older brother's brought over songs of Leonard Cohen, and that mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's just the album along with Blonde on Blonde that I brought with me to the states sold the rest off to travel through Greece. And Leonard Cohen, of course, is a poet first. Um, yes. And, because, yes. and Dylan yes. showed him, in Dylan's writing of 64, 65, 66, Dylan showed him, as he showed many others, Springsteen later on, that that poetry and music are compatible. And so that, mm -hmm. that's part of the revolutionary nature. So Leonard Cohen, yeah, I um, I consider him... Number one, as Bob said, Bob is zero, number zero, and Leonard is number one. <laughs> um, so I think, that seems fair, yeah. <laughs> yeah I think Dylan recognize that in Leonard Cohen, and I'm not sure that, I mean, the class, I don't think there's much in the way of classical, deliberate classical allusions or intertexts in, in Cohen. I think it's, I really think it's something that Dylan almost sort of reinvented, and I think it, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, um, Elliot, the love song of, of Alfred J. Proof, Proofrock is um, is right there in in um, Desolation Row. So yeah. I think Dylan is doing this from early on um, in ways that other post sixties um, songwriters aren't doing so much. So, so Joni Mitchell, I don't think so mm -hmm. so much. I think they're. I think in the case of Joni Mitchell, Leonard Cohen, Neil Young. It's that's not the process that's working there. It's it's more a it's a freer process, maybe perhaps. Um, the other the other songwriter I was thinking of is Sting. Yeah, not so much with uh, classical references, but um, a lot of English poetry references and biblical references. That's in the post police post stuff police stuff. Yeah. Though even even in in the police days, he did have a few. Mm -hmm. You know, he mentions Nabokov and. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, he has a couple of references. I wouldn't say he's sort of working so much with the text no, not, as not so much, just no. the cultural touchstones. Yeah. That's that's more common, I mm -hmm. think, uh, just re you know, alluding to a name a or name, a person. Yeah. But he does yeah. have lines from from Shakespeare in his his later his mm -hmm. solo work, yeah. yeah. And I'm less familiar with that, so I would but uh, but that sounds interesting. And and Leonard Cohen too with the with the Bible. I mean, obviously yeah. Hallelujah mm -hmm. is is yeah. his example, but there are other other instances too. I mean, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I know some of Cohen's works better than others, but I have never sat down with it and tried to do, I mean, one of the things that your book has made me now <laughs> want to do is, and I, I thank you for this because this is a good thing to want to do is to listen to some of my favorite works with a different ear. Um, because I have tended to sort of think more within the musical tradition to hear the, the quotations and the intertexts within the musical, both like the set, the actual melodies, but the, um, you know, how Dylan picks up on Guthrie or something like that. Right. Yeah. But yeah. to listen to it for a wider and to think about not just listen for that, but to think about what that means and what process is going on. Um, hasn't been how I've been thinking about some of these songwriters and who knows, maybe there's something there. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I I think that's a good a good mission, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's you know, I mean Dylan with um uh Columbus Stockade, the Guthrie, it's not just Guthrie, but the song that he probably mm -hmm. got from listening to Guthrie and then became this song that he never recorded, um, California Brian, brown eyed girl about this girl who Avril, who um was a dancer in New York that he was sort of living with in um uh, in the very oh, yeah, right. yeah. period and that, that song Columbus Stockade is a you know a guy in prison who's feeling betrayed by a woman who's you know leave me darling I don't mind and mm -hmm. uh, Averill had headed off to California so that 
So if you hear, you know, he didn't publish it. He sang it to her over the phone, apparently. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, if you hear Columbus Stockade, um, it's it's meaning the imprisoned sort of lover who's been abandoned. Um, Dylan just from the very beginning had this ability to to create characters in his song who were who connected to the art that was uh, that he was sort of hardwiring in in those years. Mm-hmm. Pivoting a little bit, but I think in some ways this is the same a, a, another parallel kind of question. Um, you know, I'm, as I'm reading, I'm I was thinking about the difference between working with ancient text and working with Dylan. And one of them is that when we study ancient poets, we we often have very little or no biographical information. We very rarely have any access to multiple versions or to their writing process. You know, they they aren't in a vacuum. There's a historical context. But in terms of their personal um, creative context, you know, often we have worse than no information about their biography. Right. Um, when you're working on Dylan about whom there's such a wealth of information, but as you already alluded to kind of presents such a shifting and contradictory story of his own life and his own writing Mm -hmm. process, you know, saying, Oh, I wrote blowing in the wind in, in 10 minutes. Um, And you rightly sort of point out in the book that maybe, or maybe that was a little bit of an oversimplification. (laughs) How does it sort of compare when you're studying these poets about whom we really come down to having just the finished product and have to recreate the process compared to to Dylan, where we have information about the process, but we kind of can't trust it. Right. And I think it really becomes the same thing. So that the lives, Mm -hmm. the ancient lives, as you know, of Virgil and Horace and so on, people are very skeptical about many of the details. Some people Mm -hmm. skeptical about all of them. I'm less so. I think there are truths, um, they had Virgil, how Virgil composed, you know, wrote a bunch of lines in the morning, then deleted, excised, sort of licked into shape. It's a term, mm-hmm. that's where the term licked into shape comes from, of a, a bear licking its mm-hmm. ears into shape. Um, uh, so that's useful if it's true. Um, um, and that doesn't, you know, that we really don't know anything about Virgil doesn't matter because it, it's, it's the art of Virgil that, his life, his circumstances, his genius created that we that is the focus we care about. And um, mm-hmm. I say it's the same thing about Dylan. What do we really know about Dylan? You know, his his mother reportedly said, you know, people don't know Bob. He's a he's a really kind, gentle man. Everybody should have a son like Bobby. One of the Nobel awarders said he seemed like a very kind man. So what does um, you know when Dylan on stage is singing "Positively Fourth Street"? You got a lot of nerve to say you are my friend. Uh, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> I wish that for just one time you could stand inside my shoes, and just for that one moment I could be you. Yes, I wish that for just one time you could stand inside my shoes. You'd know what a drag it is to see you. Sound <laughs> like a nice man, um, but that's a song. So in mm-hmm. a way, I think not having biographical information is is liberating not you know the the school record disappeared from the school fairly early on so obviously <laughs> he, he with the help of somebody or other made it disappear and you know, one of the, some detail i i dug up about his belonging to the latin club and what they were doing on a specific day I did love that. I I really did. Whatever the value of it in the you know larger sense necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it does connect us very intimately. It feels like to a no. sort of moment in his life, and that is pretty amazing. Yeah, and we don't know much. You know, the people around him don't talk much. I mean, the people who are mm. closest to him say say next to nothing. You know, people like Sarah Dillon or um, Newworth. Um, you know who with whom he shared stuff, but I think he probably didn't share, um, he's never shared the, you know, the inner Dylan, the artist, Mm -hmm. you know, what he was thinking about when he wrote this with uh, anyone. I think he, I think he saw from early on that, that that was uh, dangerous in some odd way, maybe. And that, that, that as an artist, he he was, he was going to only let so much out. 
Sometimes we see, I think there's a pattern of some kinds of artists who feel very vulnerable when they reveal about themselves and the only the, the, the way that they can reveal about themselves is through their art because that is a vulnerability they can control and that unmediated sort of sharing is too vulnerable. Um, that's a bit pop psychoanalysis on my part. But, but I mean, I think we can kind of see that with people who write and produce and paint and all the, you know, very, what seemingly very vulnerable and raw and emotional, personal material, but who are very somehow private outside of their art. Right. And so, you know, someone like uh, Bruce Springsteen, whom I love, mm -hmm. is, um, is sort of the opposite. He will, he will sort of mm -hmm. tell us about his politics and he'll chide the audience if they aren't understanding his, his position in yeah. sort of, um, Empty Sky and something like that. Yeah, I wonder. I um, wonder what Dylan thinks of uh, the layers of Catullus sixteen, if he knows it. Though I imagine that one wasn't taught in his class at the time. Um, yeah, probably school. not. I'm not. I don't <laughs> think he did enough Latin to get to that in Latin. I do think his his teacher. I think she she may have read the um, Odi et Amo I love and I hate. Mm -hmm. You ask why that is. I don't know, but I feel it happening, and I'm being tortured. Um, and he yeah, that makes it into uh, even introductory textbooks often, just as right, an example. Exactly. Yeah, and that's also simple, simple, and... simple enough mm -hmm. to sort of present to a, a you know a beginning Latin group. And and there's mm -hmm. a letter that he writes to Suze Rotolo um, that seems almost to be alluding to that. You know, when she's mm -hmm. off in Italy um, studying art, and and good for us that she did because it created songs like Boots of Spanish Leather and I Want yeah. You. So, um, but I think that you know, I think there may actually be a, a little bit of, of Catullus in there. But mm -hmm. the reason I mentioned Catullus sixteen is uh, apart from the obscenities of the opening and the ending, which make it a favorite of mine to read in class. Right. Um, <laughs> but apart from that, the the core message of it, which is Catullus saying, "You think you know me from my poems, and you you um, attack my masculinity for that, but the poem and the poet are not the same." Don't right, think you right. know me just because you've read my poems. Yeah. Um, now and you can he, deconstruct that again to say, but wait a minute, isn't this a poem in which you're telling me that <laughs> poem and poet are not the same? Yeah. What, what should I believe? I'll do this. I, I'm teaching Catullus this term, and I I yes. learn all the poems, and so we, I I actually say what I'm not going to say on the air. I will X you about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And why are you for saying that I'm I'm like this because of um, because my poems are somewhat risque, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, so and and Dylan, you know the the um, Dylan's discovery of uh, Rambeau, for which various people take credit, uh, as well as mm -hmm. Rotolo. Um, Dylan writes about this in Chronicles a bit, but Dylan's discovery of I is another, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is is which the Roman poets you. Uh, Certainly no, yeah. Millennia ago, and that poem that you rightly pick on, Catullus 16, is, is mm -hmm. precisely about that, and that Dylan mm -hmm. had been practicing that art, but, but that he saw in that statement that, that Rambeau, the person, is, is somebody other. I mean, that's, this is now conventional sort of narratological theory. But, uh, yeah, but it, it does take coming to. Um, exactly. When you're either because you're young and haven't been exposed to it yet, or because it hadn't yet been become sort of conventional wisdom, it, it it does take coming to, I think. Yeah, and when we hear a song, we want to, particularly when it's somebody like Dylan or Neil Young or Leonard Cohen, we yeah. want the sentiment to be the sentiment of the, of the historical. Bob Dylan or the historical Robert Zimmerman, I guess, mm -hmm. to say, if we're if we're trying to identify the sentiment of the song with the person of the singer rather than the persona of the of the singer, that's that's I think a a human impulse that we want to know. We have a curiosity about the the artists that we love, and we want to you know, get close mm -hmm. to what they're actually thinking rather than the thought that they're turning into art through various. Yeah, I mean, that's the central paradox of like the Roman elegists, I think, um, that they play with and someone like Ovid plays with it, even more so uh, that they know you want to know them through their poetry. And they're always playing with letting you in or not letting you in. I don't know that Dylan is 
as focused on that, perhaps that, you know, that's not as much the point of his songs as it is, I think, the point of some of, say, Ovid's Amores. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think it's still a tension there that he knows. And you you refer to this when you talk about how he sort of seems to have a, a paradoxical relationship to performing, that he finds it really hard to be so visible and yet is only happy on stage. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a uh, paraphrase of what what he said, but something like that. Right, whereas Leonard Cohen, you know, only went on stage, well, not only, but mostly when he got ripped off and had to sort of mm -hmm. build up his to pay the bills. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that, yeah, I mean, so someone like Arvid, exactly the Amores. Um, so I was about to sing of epic, but Cupid came along and stole a foot away. So now I'm writing elegiac couplets, which um, you can't do epic in that meter. So I guess I'm I'll have to write love poetry. Um, so I, here I am writing love poetry, but I don't have a girlfriend or boyfriend yet to write love poetry. So this <laughs> existential impossibility of being in love, but uh, but, <laughs> but with, with no object doesn't exist. So. But then he I, finds, and uh, then the identity is a, a love poet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I and I think the exile poems um, are similar. They, uh -huh. which, you know, which Dylan has so brilliantly integrated into into modern times a number of us yes which i think is kind of wonderful because i do think uh, just from the perspective of the exile poems are an under studied and under appreciated element of ovid i'm not an i haven't really worked on ovid and i they're underappreciated by me as well but i do think that uh, i've done a little bit of work recently teaching them actually and and have realized that i should have been paying more attention to them yeah, yeah, I I taught a course in the evening school, extension school at Harvard, a couple of years ago on them, on just the exile poems, and uh, oh yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. And of course, Dylan Dylan read it in Peter Green's Penguin translation, uh, with mm -hmm. fantastic, translation. just a very good one, yeah. And and again, sort of selecting lines. No one could ever say that I took up arms against you. You know, that's mm -hmm. up to Augustus, the emperor who's exiled him, but Dylan. In Working Man Blues number two, that line becomes the line to a, a lover who's no longer on the scene and uh, you know, mm -hmm. becomes a line of regret and longing in, in just a completely different way. But Dylan read it, read that line, precisely that line, mm -hmm. and saw its potential for his song. So, um, you know, it's exactly, mm -hmm. as, he, as you know as well as I do, that's exactly what someone like Virgil or Catullus is doing. Mm -hmm. So... One of the, the sort of larger messages that I, I take from this work, and I think is it, it really lines up with uh, how I think about things, is that it's useful to sometimes step out of your uh, the, the confines of your field. Obviously, studying Latin poetry has affected your understanding of Dylan. But I wonder, uh, has it worked the other way for you? Has working on Dylan affected how you approach Latin poetry? Yeah, that's a great uh, a great question. Um, uh, I think that the short answer is yes. I mean, I'm still processing the ways. So I've done, you know, the freshman seminar that I've done since 2004. I did partly because I started seeing what Dylan was doing since the since Love and Theft in 2001. I guess I I guess in a way I it's contributed to the sort of the dropping of boundaries, um, chronological and and even even sort of generic boundaries that I see. It's allowed me to see that somebody like Virgil, who we're told, you know, would walk into the a theater and people would get up and applaud or that the crowd mm -hmm. had to duck into somebody's house when the crowd noticed him that, you know, that, that Virgil was, you know, a rock star <laughs> essentially of his day. So that he, Virgil was pop. Um, he was um, pop who became a classic because of the, quality of this pop, whereas most of the pop music of the 60s is um, a lot of it, too much of it is still embedded in my in my head, but, um, <laughs> but it, uh, it didn't last as Dylan did. So it's, yeah, it's helped me to see, to try and reach a synchronic mm -hmm. understanding of, of what it would have been like to get up some morning in the year uh, 37 or 35 BCE and and read Virgil's Eclogues and realize that the world of Roman literature was utterly transformed, um, you know, never to be the same again. I mean, Virgil was 
taught, we're told, was taught in his own lifetime. So what poets are taught in their own lifetime, Bob Dylan, my mm-hmm. seminar, obviously. But um, People who are writing within their own lifetime and while they're still producing as well, right. I think. Because sometimes, you know, once the body of work is produced, the writer might discourteously hang around for a while. But people feel like they're they're gone, but he's still producing things that are still worth yeah. studying. Yeah, and it's also there's another detail, you know, that helps me read the ancients through Dylan. I mean, that, that we're told that Virgil, nobody could read Virgil like Virgil, that the effect of Virgil reading. Uh, and, um, right. you know, you listen to my friend David Ferry, the poet who's just translated the Aeneid, a wonderful uh, version of that, hearing him read it, he knows what he meant with the poetry uh, of it. So, mm-hmm. And Dylan is the same. I don't, there's not a single song, not one that I prefer, including Henrik's All Along the Watchtower, which I love. But Dylan then took mm-hmm. on that arrangement and, and never sang the pre Henrik's version. Yeah. Um, but I'd even include that in saying that, you know, it's the person of Dylan, the appearance, the voice, the look, the mystique, the, you know, the, mm-hmm. the image that you have created of him in your head that, that is part of the performance and the, the lyrics. So, you know, that, as in many other ways, a poet like Virgil, you know, the supreme poet of his day, and a songwriter like Dylan, poet like Dylan, I'm comfortable calling him that, um, um, mm-hmm. are really the same. So that, um, and when Dylan is gone, you know, we'll have. That's why the archive mm-hmm. at Tulsa is so important, and the and the careful preservation of the record of Bob Dylan you know, will allow. You know, whatever future he has, I mean, I think he'll be around in 200 years. I'm not sure in what ways he'll be around in 200 years, mm-hmm. but um, he'll be away, at least around in the way that, that Wordsworth and Blake and Coleridge are, are around, who are, are read still by the young, mm-hmm. not just by English professors, right? Yeah, I think so. I, I, one, predicting the future and and <laughs> and the future of aesthetic taste is a bit difficult, but I think it, it he has his... He's certainly as likely to be around as anybody producing in the 20th century, let's put it yeah, that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Assuming there is any memory of the 20th century on the world, <laughs> we haven't all been wiped off of it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, the monument more lasting than bronze, exactly. I think, yeah. he That's participates horror. in. It's funny that Dylan hasn't um, engaged Horace to mind. With Horace. But, mm. um, I think he... Maybe the next album. I'm hoping there will be a there will be another one, but that would be fun. Yeah. There'll be a, a a carpe diem moment or two at least, right. yeah. <laughs> or maybe that's too obvious. Maybe it'll have to be something a yeah. little less uh, less obvious. There was one point that I just wanted to bring up because I kept seeing you, you focus understandably more on um, Virgil and Ovid because those are the clear actual intertextual uh, allusions that he has in uh, the more recent poems, songs, whatever. But one thing, because Catullus is, for me, my favorite as well, you mentioned that you like him. I am very fond of Catullus. Uh, it's not only um, Catullus 16 and that poetic persona issue, but um, I was struck by when you talked about Catullus 11, the goodbye poem to Lesbia, that's quite famous. Um, and you, you tied it to a couple of his songs more in mood than in specific allusions or, or sort of in the way he can manipulate and, and evoke feelings of sadness and, and goodbyes and things. But the other thing that, I, that struck me is the way that I think there's a commonality between the two poets in terms of how they can mix sort of beauty and tenderness along with brutally cutting insults and and also humor. I mean, Catullus 11 to me is so much that. There's there's that lovely, lovely sapphic simile and at the same time, you know, a really quite vile message to lesbia. And the song um, Don't Think Twice is the one that comes to mind for me. I was raised on 60s Dylan, so yeah. that's what's most in my head. But that sweetness, there's some lovely, bittersweet lyrics in that song, but you just kind of wasted my precious time has always been the line to me that is just the most brutal rejection you can make to someone. And being able to mix those two things, I think that's something that I see as a 
I'm not saying it's influence necessarily, but a, a commonality between the two of them. And I don't know if that comes out of actually having read some of these poems or if it's just uh, uh, something that they both came to. Right. Yeah, there is a classicist too, um, following on some of my work in the in the early 2000s, um, claimed that, that Dylan had been reading Catullus and sort of lined up mm-hmm. some of the, the, the poems that you talk about. And, it, and, and I don't think that's the case. I think... Um, I don't think Dylan was was doing what he did. I don't right. think Dylan was doing in the '60s with classical texts. I think it was an accident of two youthful geniuses. So Catullus was in his twenties and uh, mm-hmm. didn't get much past his twenties ever. Um, and you know, I think he did have an affair, which didn't work out well. But his art is what is what sort of kicked in with whatever mm-hmm. situation. And yeah, and I think that the ability, yeah. Catullus 11 is a, a good instance and ending with you know, let her yeah, let her make love with her 300 adulteries um, um, and not look mm-hmm. back for my love which, and then even in the sapphic simile for my love which through her fault has not been like the flower on the edge of the meadow has been not crushed by the plow but has been nicked, touched by the plow mm-hmm. so the the flower is still alive, but it's dying. And so Catullus still has feelings, but they're dying and they will die. So even at that, with that sort of brutal moment. Now, is that true? And you just kind of wasted my precious time. Yeah, which is one of the, you know, one of the toughest lines, but don't think twice mm-hmm. it's all right. But in, is it really all right? Yeah. Dylan, is he all right with it? <laughs> and so I think there's the same why would you do a song like that if it was really all right? Um, yes. And then he'll keep doing that. I mean, Idiot Wind, you know, playing Idiot mm-hmm. in uh, a Rolling Thunder review when his wife, Sarah, the divorce is going to go through the next year. Um, you know, she's in the audience. and and But then, you know, there are versions, we're idiots, babe. It's a wonder that we still know how to breathe. You know, so it's... Uh, right. There's always... Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's not, I think... I can't think of a song where there's finality because if there's finality, um, why write a song about it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There has to be some sort of tension or or progress to be made or a question that's left open. Yeah, some residue of, of something that, that mattered. So was the time completely wasted? Um, yeah. So is that again a moment, the, the momentary anger of the singer who's you know, trying to convince himself that he wasted his precious time? <laughs> you know, yeah. we're getting a little, little lit critty here. <laughs> I know. I can, I find it very hard not to. <laughs> it's, uh, but I think that's. I mean, I think that's the value. Of, I, I don't know if I've mentioned that I very much enjoyed your book. I enjoyed your writing and and your engagement, which was. Um, it's. I, I, I enjoyed the balance of sort of the little literary criticism and the personal and the. Mm. Uh, and the contextualizing of setting it within, you know, the various periods, both of Dylan's life and the historical moments. Yeah. Um, Thank you. What... How did your dad like it? <laughs> he liked it. He, it is funny. I think he has um, a slightly more paradoxical uh, approach to Dylan. Like my my parents love Dylan's music and have always loved it and have sung it all their lives. But he's a little less enchanted with Dylan the man perhaps <laughs> right yeah so he's 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 a he's a Joni person uh perhaps a little bit more of one yeah and of some of the but but he really enjoyed the the he he fit, put it down and he said now I just need to go listen to more music uh-huh. <laughs> so. and I think I hope what it will do is bring people help bring people to the later music you know I mean there are a lot of people yes. out there who think either think, well, until the Nobel may have even thought that Bob Dylan wasn't with us anymore, but <laughs> realized he was doing a hundred shows a year and and, mm-hmm. and producing these these um these colossally brilliant albums mm-hmm. in the last of the last twenty years. Well I think it did that for both me and my dad. because um, I certainly I just went out and bought the last three on iTunes oh, okay. and before, you know, over the last week, because I didn't know them well. I had heard some of them. Um, Thunder, uh, Thunder, Roland yeah. Thunder, is it? Uh, that one and um, Duquesne, Duquesne. I can't remember titles. 
why doesn't he just number them all like (laughs) poets I could do that those are both the opening songs of um, Rhymes and Tempest too yeah and I think they wear out perhaps as singles a little bit more too so that I heard them I'd heard them and a few others, but I didn't know all of them. And uh, my, I think my dad's interested in, in picking those up too. And so I also appreciate that because I do like being reminded of what's out there. Yeah. <laughs> Reasons to listen to things. Maybe to wrap up then, um, I'll ask you the question one should never ask a scholar. Um, so what is the next book? <laughs> <laughs> Or has, you know, you wrote this book, um, obviously, in part in reaction to the Nobel win or as a consequence of that moment. Has it made you think about continuing working on Dylan? Have you any interest in continuing this process with someone else? Yeah. So um, I thought when I did it that I would get back to working on Tacitus, uh, who's a new Mm -hmm. Found research interest of, of mine, the greatest Roman historian, um, and some mm-hmm. Dylan mentions and has been reading, I think, and engaging. That's not why I got into that. <laughs> but um, but then in the process of writing the book, I, I've gotten two or three ideas of other Dylan projects. So I, I always tell my students to work on something that is firing you up. Don't work, don't do a dissertation on something that isn't sort of coming from from deep down in your, mm-hmm. in your, and so to apply that, I, I, yeah, I think I'm going to, uh, I'll keep, I'll only teach the Dylan seminar every four years. So the next time will be 2020 and long may he run and maybe we'll have another mm-hmm. album, but I keep giving you no, more material. Yeah. yeah. But I want to also dig around in the archives, um, in Tulsa, which have just been open to scholars fairly recently. And, uh, there are a couple of periods that I'm particularly interested in, so I want to look at that and and um, from a textual point of view, partly, but um, and not just looking to see if I can find more classics, but um, looking at the process of writing and rewriting. That um, there's a bit mm. in the book. I have a bit on the early versions of Tangled Up and Blue that nobody is. Yes. And they're in the archive. So, I'm, yeah, I want to do that. But I also have a, a couple of projects that would involve just me reading and thinking and listening um, to, to mm-hmm. that are out there that, um, that I think I will do. So I'm off in the, I'm on leave in the spring, so I plan to get out to Tulsa a couple of times. And, uh, and yeah, so I think I'll, Tacitus will be there um, when I come back to him. But uh, and yeah, and my teaching is is all you know, going to be the usual. But uh, uh, you know, which doesn't exclude Dylan. Dylan, Dylan comes into almost every class I teach. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's one of the values. We were talking about that before we started um, recording. That I think that's one of the values of doing this kind of work is it does give you a connection to students and to people who, and to non-students. It, it allows it allows people to come to the classical texts who might feel they are otherwise off limits or uninteresting or not for them. Because if Dylan is coming to them, why can't they? And if you can, if they're interested in Dylan and read your book, you've done that work of bridging that gap for them. Yeah. And showing them that they can read Catullus too. There's no reason they can't. Right. It's right there beside their Dylan. Tight connection to my heart, as Bob says. But yeah, no, absolutely. And I hope that that's what this book will do. I hope it will, will be, uh, you know, my literature is does okay, but there are, I, had a, I have a student who was in the in the Dylan seminar last year. He's now a sophomore and he's doing Catullus. So he had good Latin. Three of the students had good Latin. Mm-hmm. And he um, he was talking about Achilles to a fellow student, a Harvard undergraduate, who didn't know who Achilles was. And so mm-hmm. he talked about the Trojan War, and that student didn't really know what the Trojan War was either. And so, you know, in 1974, when when Nixon was um, was nabbed, there's a photo of him and Haldeman and Rosemary Woods on the cover of Newsweek magazine with the Watergate tapes entangling them, which was an allusion to the Laocoon statue group from mm-hmm. Aeneid, where the serpents are sent to to kill Laocoon, who warned against bringing the, ho- the Trojan horse into Troy. So that image could be on Newsweek um, only 40 years ago, 40 plus years ago, but it could never be on Newsweek right now, I think, because of um, 
no one would be able to make that connection, yeah. And it's true that canons are problematic, but canons have existed for centuries because of something about works like the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Aeneid, and others that um, that are timeless. And if, if those mm-hmm. get lost, you know, as they're in the process of, of being lost at some level, then humans, and not just the humanities, but humans um, suffer from that. So yeah, I'm hoping that and I think Dylan realizes that. I think Dylan is, just as he's bringing the American standards back to life um, in performance mm-hmm. and in the last um, three albums, I think he's, that's what he's doing with the classics as well, um, sending us back there and preserving them. And opening them up and, and yeah, saying, exactly. and so, one of the reasons canons can be problematic is when they're exclusionary. And so to say these classical texts are not only for a little elite and they are open to you is part of what makes those canonical texts important again. Yes. To say that they aren't a marker of elite, um, the past, they are something that is meaningful to everyone. Yeah. And they were all pop in the sense of being popular Mm with, uh, with the people. I mean, the the Mm -hmm. Athenian, Athenians sort of heard Homer, constantly in Mm -hmm. the context of festivals and other contexts. So, um, and that's why, I mean, it's interesting that we're in an age of translation, probably um, six or seven translation, poetic translations of the Aeneid since 2000. And and now the first woman translator of the Odyssey, Mm -hmm. um, Emily Mm -hmm. Wilson, a fantastic translation. I'll put in a plug for that, but, um, Yes, uh, we're waiting on that book arriving ourselves because I am very much looking forward to reading that. Yeah, and, uh, very much. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Fagel's Odyssey is the one that Dylan read, mm-hmm. added. I think Dylan says he read the Odyssey way back, and I think he did. I mean, it's I think it's pretty big in American high school curricula. But uh, mm-hmm. so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, the stuff is alive, and uh, you know, we just have to you know, get the message out somehow. <laughs> it, when we have people urging us to all do send all of our students to STEM classes, and and um, mm-hmm. you wonder where you know, where that all ends. But I think there's been some crack in that in the notion that that is a, a universal um, panacea that you can do that you know, yes. without living an examined life, which involves should involve thinking about literature, listening to music, and mm-hmm. so on. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's a pretty good note to end on, really. <laughs> the examined life. <laughs> well, it's great to chat, and um, thank you. Yes, and thank you very much for the book and for this conversation. It yes. was really stimulating. It was. Okay, well, I much enjoyed it, and it's great to talk to another classicist about Bob Dylan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.